Hey there, Awaken 514. We're kicking off uh, just another weekend apart this weekend. But listen, it's okay that we're apart because we're still together in spirit. And uh, I know that so many of you are praying for one another, serving one another where possible. And I know that we're going to get to be together again soon. And so in the meantime, uh, we thought it might be a great opportunity for us to just continue to worship in our homes with our families, to engage uh, in a life that Christ would call us to uh, as a family, diving into his word together as he seeks to teach us and shape us, even though we're not together. And and so uh, today we continue in a series we kicked off two weeks ago. Uh, We took a brief break last weekend, but uh, we're going to be right back into this series, uh, The Story of Redeeming Ruth. And so if you're not familiar, the book of the Bible that we're in is, uh, is the book of Ruth. And uh, it's an incredible story written by an incredible story teller. More on that in a little bit. But uh, the story is incredible as it kind of looks at uh, the unforeseen forces in the world, shaping and molding the things that we just can't control. And so as I think about those unforeseen forces, I think about how I have absolutely terrible luck. I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but I don't play tri- tricky trades. I don't gamble. I, uh, not, uh, I mean, not because I have some moral uh, 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 feeling against the idea of putting a ticket in a little bag and hoping to win a barbecue. I, I mean, I'm okay with that. I just, uh, I feel like for me, it's, it's always just been a, a lesson in futility for me. And I, I think there's some reason why we'll get into in a little bit. But I, I remember the first time I realized this in my life. Um, I was still in elementary school. I'm not sure what grade, but uh, we, my family and I lived upstate New York for a period of my life. And uh, most of my elementary school years were upstate New York in the boondocks. And uh, it's there that I learned to ride four wheelers and shoot guns and, and teach crayfish how to uh, fight each other in the bottom of uh, Frisbee, uh, probably knowing that one day uh, I would marry a country girl and God would move me to central PA. Uh, but but it's there uh, that I remember uh, getting on my bike, riding through three miles into town. And yes, it was probably uphills both ways in the snow without shoes. But I remember riding three miles into town uh, most summers with my brother in tow, my older brother. And and I remember getting into town and and there was always a couple of kids that lived in the village. And so we'd get there and uh, much like if you're from this area, you know a village like this, a town like Grampian, uh, that was our town. I mean, we had one blinking light at the center of town and uh, it had uh, four stores on the corner and that was it. That's what we had other than a one pump gas station, a couple houses down and uh uh, on the one store was our corner store. That's what we called it. And on one side was a little pizza shop. And on the other side was a small convenience store. And I remember all summer long, we spent eating lunch at that location. We'd go, we'd go swimming in the town pool. We'd play behind the elementary school. And just uh, at lunchtime, we'd go down with whatever change we could scrounge early in the morning from my mom's change drawer. And, and, and we'd just go buy ourselves a slice of pizza. And then I remember early one summer, I went to one of the coolers to get a drink and a bottle of Sprite said about this incredible contest they were running where one in four, one in four wins a prize. And I thought, man, this is great odds. I'm going to drink Sprite all summer long. I mean, I got a drink. I got to stay hydrated. I'm going to drink Sprite. And so I remember playing that bottle cap game all summer. I mean, I kept drinking Sprite, twisting a cap, looking underneath it, and every single time it was a non-winner. Now, for my skeptics out there, and, and maybe you're a bit like I am, I'm, uh, I don't know if it's the jersey in me or the middle child in me, but I'm a bit of a skeptic, and uh, I, you'd probably be led to believe, well, you know, Coca-Cola company was, was just busting your guys' chops. Like, you, you weren't going to win one in four. It's probably more like one in 40,000, right? And um, I would agree with you. If not for the fact that my buddy who lived in town and hung out with us all summer won like every other day. I mean, it was infuriating. And I remember this one day we went in and we got our pizza and I got my Sprite and we were laughing about this, about my horrible luck. And he's like, hey, what if we just switch bottles? I was like, all right. So we buy our Sprite and we switch the bottles and I like Charlie Bucket from Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. I twist off my caps ever so slowly, like like Charlie Bucket does when he's opening the candy bar for his golden ticket. And I turn over this cap and it's not a winner. And my buddy, he starts laughing because he won. He won with the Sprite that I purchased that day. I mean, infuriating, but I just, I just realized early on that I, I wasn't going to gamble anymore because I'm terrible at it. Even games of chance, I'm horrible at it. And then you start to realize that this idea of luck as you get older is how you and I often describe things that are beyond our own control but seem 
wildly improbable. Things like chance, happenstance, luck, and coincidence. Those things that have no reason to work out the way that they have, but for some reason they've worked out that way. Everything else you and me sometimes chalk up to us being in control. That we did something right, we were in the right place, we uh, said the right thing, we manipulated and controlled our circumstances in such a way that we've uh, worked them to our favor. But when they're seemingly beyond our control, and there's a lot of things that are, we have no framework to describe them and we simply call it coincidence, luck chance. Well, the Bible paints a very different picture of what these unforeseen forces are in the world. It doesn't ascribe this to luck or coincidence. In fact, it has a very different idea of what's going on that you and I might not see right off the top. And so a few weeks ago, we began this series in the book of Ruth, and the first chapter begins this story with a man named Elimelech. And Elimelech is living in the time period in Israel called the Judges, a period that is by its own definition a period where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Now, I don't know if you have small kids. I, um, I suspect that if you've had small kids, you, you get the idea of what it looks like when everyone does what's right in their own eyes. Um, it's chaos. Right, And so this is what it looked like in Israel. If you didn't want to tell the truth, then don't tell the truth. And if you want to skim a little bit off the top, then skim a little bit off the top. If that guy wrongs you, well, then do whatever you need to do to level the playing field. And if that means burying him in your backyard, then, hey, if that seems right in your own eyes, then go ahead and do it. I mean, this is a dark, dark period in, in the life of Israel. And this man, Elimelech, not only lives in this period, but then all of a sudden famine washes over the land. And it's not like the kind of famine we're experiencing right now. Like, I know you're panicked. There are no toilet paper at Walmart. But uh, this kind of famine was not a matter of waiting for Walmart to restock their shelves, knowing that there's food in a warehouse somewhere. No, this kind of famine was the kind of famine where there was no food. And so Elimelech comes up with an idea. He's going to take matters into his own hands, and he decides he's going to leave the land that God promised to the Israelite people, and he's going to go to a land named Moab. Now, Moab was this dark, dark place. It was a place that had animosity with the Israelites and tension and had this odd ability to lead the Israelites into darkness and wickedness. And so they're already there, but um, there wasn't going to be anything that led them into goodness in Moab in spite of that. He still takes his family to Moab where he says, hey, at least they've got food. It won't stir our hearts to love God anymore. It's not going to help get us back on track to live in a way that we know we should, but at least we'll have food. So they depart from trusting God and they start trusting themselves and they move to the land of Moab. And uh, Elimelech takes his wife Naomi and his two sons. And shortly after getting there, Elimelech, he himself dies. And the two boys, the two sons, they marry later in life. They marry um, two Moabite women, women who would not stir their affections, stir their love for God, because these women didn't even know the God of the Israelites. And then these two boys, they die off too, leaving their mother Naomi, a widowed, sonless woman, left only with her two foreign daughter-in-laws. And so Naomi does what many of us do. She returns to what she finds comfortable and familiar. When things get the darkest, it's so common for you and I to find something that's familiar to us and try to grab some sense of comfort and security out of it. And so she returns to the people of Israel and goes back to her home. Now, the two daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Ruth, have a decision to make. Either stay behind and have a life here in Moab where they could remarry, have children, and um, pursue an entire life of their own, or follow Naomi back to Israel, a place that would hate them for being foreign, a place that would remember all of the misdeeds of, her, of their own people, and in reality probably have a limited opportunity to continue their life. They'd be stuck bound to this woman, Naomi, who was too old to provide and too old to remarry and provide them with uh, future sons that they might marry. And so Orpah, she stays back. She goes back to her Moabite people, back to her mother and father, back to her way of life. But Ruth, she clings to Naomi and demands that she take her with her. She says, I'm coming with you whether you like it or not. And Naomi, in her self-pity, she almost like she just wants to be alone. She wants to run away from her, but she can't get rid of Ruth. She can't shake her. And so she's, she, she winds up back in Bethlehem. And as she enters the town at the end of chapter 1, the people come flooding out in excitement to see Naomi yet again. 
And Naomi, in her self-pity, can't see that there's any goodness that have come. She can't be grateful that Ruth has stayed with her. She tells the people, I left full, but I've come back empty. Don't call me blessed, call me bitter. She changes her name from Naomi, which means blessed, to Mara, which just simply means bitter. And then, as I said before, the storyteller in Ruth, who writes this down for us, is a master storyteller. And because at the very end of chapter one, imagine it like a, like a series on television or on Netflix where uh, you break it up into episodes. And so each chapter is like an episode of this short mini series. And at the end of episode one, it's almost as if the camera, and I don't know if your brain works like this, mine does, probably because of too much cinema and media and movies, but it's almost as if the cameraman starts to pull back up over this little village and, and Naomi and Ruth and this crowd of people around him begin to get smaller and smaller and smaller as, as the camera angle widens and widens and widens beyond the borders of the village into the fields where you see harvesters beginning the harvest. And it's almost as if it's the director's way of showing us that there's more to come, that the story's not over, and that this harvest is going to play a significant role in the story to come. And so we open chapter 2. We, we open here in Ruth chapter 2 to pick up a story of despair, of tragedy, of trauma, one filled with anxiety and fear and death, one without hope that has sprinkled and peppered in the story of hope with nothing more than the grain fields on the outskirts of town. And so episode two begins, and it begins in an interesting way, and I'll explain that. Again, I don't know if your brain works like mine, but it begins in an interesting way that I'll share with you in just a moment. But verse one, chapter two goes like this. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a man named Boaz, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech. Now, at first you're like, this is an odd way to begin this story, but I want you to think about some of the TV series that you've watched. Right, right before the credits roll, there's sometimes this scene that sets up the episode, right? It's called a, a cold opening. It basically means that they're going to tease out something that's going to pepper in and, and uh, sprinkle across the rest of the episode, but it seems completely unrelated to either what happened uh, in the last episode or it seems completely unrelated to uh, what you're hoping you would jump into the regular story about, but it, it's laying the foundation. And that's what it feels like. It feels like the director opened this episode with this man who wakes up out of bed, the, the sun coming through his window at dawn. And he swings his legs over the edge of the bed and he hits the floor and he begins his morning in prayer. Just a devoted man to God. That's the first thing we see is this man is devoted. He's praying and then he's reading some of the scrolls uh, of his ancient people, just trying to connect with his God. And instantly, we know this is a good, hardworking man. And, and then he goes out to the chicken coop and he gets some eggs and he brings them inside. He cracks them in a pan. He starts to fry up his breakfast. And then he, we see him laying out his clothes and getting dressed. And then as he walks out of the house, the camera stays behind and as the door closes behind him, it almost pans up and over to this tapestry on the wall. A, a picture of the tribe of Elimelech, their family crest, hanging right there on the wall. And then your opening sequence begins. You know, your, your opening music with your opening credits. And we're into episode two. There's a glimmer of hope here. And so, as I said, the storyteller is a masterful storyteller. And so, in verse 2, it says, And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean amongst the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And Naomi said to her, Go, my daughter. So, they get back into town and Ruth decides that while my, Naomi is maybe too old to work, she's uh, resting in self-pity and bitterness and wallowing in despair, that she's going to do something. And so uh, she gets up and she says, Naomi, I'm, I'm going to go into the fields and I'm going to glean. Now, this idea of gleaning was an incredible system left behind by God. It uh, was probably the original welfare system. Now, some of you, you get clammy here because uh, you, you err on one side or the other as far as how you feel about um, giving people a hand out or a leg up. And I, I get that. I, I understand how we can. But, but God had this perfect system. 
You see, in a farming culture, what he had advised his uh, farm owners to do is that they were not to reap their fields to the very edges, and they were only to go through it once before they allowed the gleaners to come behind. Now, uh, you probably know that anytime you do something the first time around, you're not going to do it with perfection. You're not going to do it with uh, complete excellence. You're not going to scrape it to the very bottom. And that was God's plan. That for, the, for those who are orphaned and widows and the homeless, that this created an opportunity for them to come behind the reapers and for them to collect all that had fallen behind, all that had not been reaped to the very edges, all that had fallen off the wagon as they pulled it across the field, all that the reapers missed as they uh, swung their sickles. It was an incredible opportunity for them to come behind to work for, for their food, but an opportunity nonetheless to get their daily bread. And, and for the owners of those fields, it was a reminder for them of the favor and blessing of God, that they would not hoard all of their resources for fear that they would somehow not have enough for themselves. There's something in there for us in this season, isn't there? That fear wouldn't drive these individuals to think that their daily bread came from reaping their fields to the very edges, but that they would remain gracious with all that they had, open-handed with all that they have, recognizing that it's God who gives them their daily bread. And so Ruth gets up in the morning and she goes into the field and she begins gleaning because her and Naomi need to eat. And I love this about Ruth. She's a humble woman who's proactive. But she's not proactive like Elimelech was proactive. Elimelech, I appreciate his pragmatism, but Elimelech leaves the promised land, walks outside of the scope of what God would have commanded him and says, God, I can't trust you anymore. I'll take this upon myself. Whereas Ruth is proactive in such a way where she says, God, I trust you. And this is the parameter. These are the boundaries you've set for me. And inside these boundaries, I'm going to trust you. Even though this woman is a foreign woman who wouldn't have had much experience with the God of the Israelites, the God of this Bible. And so she wakes up and she goes into the field. So she set out and she went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened, she happened to come upon to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. Now, I I love the author's words here because that idea of happened, uh, he's literally writing or she's literally writing, we don't know, um, is literally writing into the text, uh, literally translates as, um, uh, as luck would have it. Now that That's an interesting expression, isn't it? Because I just told you before, the Bible doesn't believe in luck. And so here this author is writing this into the story. And here's what we find out about this author's creativity in their writing. They're dripping with sarcasm. They're kind of poking fun at this idea that it didn't just happen. It wasn't by happenstance or by chance or by luck or by coincidence that Ruth stumbles upon Boaz's land. This man who is of the tribe of Elimelech. And you probably wonder why that matters, but it's going to become extremely important here in just a moment. But it got me thinking. Like, how many places in your life do you feel like sometimes that things are just coincidence? Right, and and coincidence has this interesting way of making us kind of have a a sense of awe for the way the universe is wired. And I, I love to absolutely hear people's stories about how they came to be where they are, how they met their spouse, how they wound up in a career that they have, and uh, how they even came to faith. Because there's so much coincidence in their stories, so many uh, moments in their life and in their story that are just these thin, thin threads that, that you look at and you go, man, that's, that's incredible. And, and as you hear it, it kind of invokes in them, you can hear it in their voice and in you, this sense of awe, like, that's incredible how that came together. How, how you met your spouse the one time, they, they showed up at college to do a, a walkthrough and you were their tour guide and then they decided to go to a different college, but you guys stayed in touch as pen pals. That's amazing. Well, it's even more amazing because, you know, my, uh, the person who was supposed to do the tour guide got the flu that night and I had to step in and do it for them. I was supposed to be off on that day. Like, like when you look at the thin threads that bind us, it's like, wow. But instead of having awe and reverence for the unforeseen powers of the universe, the Bible paints a different picture that there's actually a God behind it orchestrating these details. This is why the author says that she happened to come upon it. He's poking fun at this idea that it was just chance. And maybe you're sitting there going, I, 
How, how is that chance? How, how is that just co- not coincidence? Like, like how would God have led her to that field? And uh, to be honest, I don't know, but when I hear stories that many of you have told me and the stories that I've heard and even looked at in my own life, I go, well, you know, maybe she was walking out of town. She stepped out her door that morning and thought I could go right down that road or left down that road. And I just, she's like, I really wanted to go left, but I had this strong urge that I should have went right. Well, I uh, walked up to three other fields before this one and the people just seemed really unfriendly. I, I just stayed away from that field. It seemed like those guys were eyeing me with a really bad look in their eye and I just was afraid to be there and I went on to the next field. Something guided her that day to Boaz's field, much like something's guided you throughout your life and woven together, threaded together the impossible, improbable circumstances of your life that have brought you to even watching this video. And then the story continues. As she's gleaning in Boaz's field, you'll find out here why it's so important that Boaz is of the tribe of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they said, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young men who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? And a servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, well, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said to us this morning, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves from the reapers. And so she came and she continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. And so Boaz shows up and he has this incredible exchange with his workers. I don't know if your boss greets you like that. The Lord bless you. I, I hope good things for you. I hope God does amazing things in your life. Happy Monday. I don't know about you, but that hasn't been my experience with most bosses. And, and then he notices because he cares about people, because he not only notices his workers and cares deeply for the soul of the people working for him, he then notices that there's another face in his field that he's never once noticed before. Because this is a man who doesn't see people as commodities, but as beautiful pieces of God's divine plan. And he sees this woman out there and he says, who, who's she? I've never seen her before. And they tell her, you know how you heard Naomi came back to town with this uh, foreigner? She, that's her. And let me tell you, man, she'd been working in the field I mean, all day she took a small break, but to be honest, she's, worked, she's outworked everybody here. She's been working diligently. She's been very polite. She asked before she stepped into the field, despite the fact that she had the right to glean. She was polite enough to even ask. She had no expectations that we would take care of her, but humbly just engaged and said, hey, can I, can I have an opportunity to, to work this field? And so Boaz approaches her and he says to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, Do not glean in any other field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessel and drink what the young men have drawn. So so Boaz goes to her and says, listen, um, I've let our our team know. I've let my reapers know. I've let my staff know. Like, you're going to be here. Don't, Don't leave my field. If you do, there are some pretty unsavory characters out there that may do some unsavory things. You're not safe out there. But I want to care for you. I want to create a safe space for you. Come and glean in my fields. This is a safe place for you. And in the meantime, the men have drawn water. Help yourself to the water as well that they've drawn from the well. You don't need to go draw your own well, well water. And then Ruth responds. He offers her safety, security, comfort, and care. And Ruth responds, not with arrogance, not with expectation, but with humility. So Ruth fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to Boaz, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? Now, this is funny, because she left that day, if you remember, looking to find favor. She didn't find favor and go, See, I knew I'd find favor. I knew God was going to work out for me. I knew he had an obligation to take care of me or protect me. She doesn't do that. She engages and still is in shock over the favor she's found because she knows intrinsically that she doesn't deserve this favor. That when she left that morning, she left with nothing. When she returned home to Bethlehem with Naomi, she forsook everything. She had nothing. Like Naomi returning with nothing, Ruth actually has nothing. She's returned with a self-pitying, bitter mother-in-law with no money, no hope for a marriage, children, or a future. All she's done is hinged herself to this woman who 
she now has to take care of. She left that morning hoping that her God, Naomi's God, would help her find favor. And when the favor shows up, she's in awe, knowing she does not deserve what she's received. And so Boaz responds, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and your mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you've done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, in whose wings you have come to take refuge beneath. So, so Boaz says, listen, I, I'm, I'm amazed that you've left everything. But you've left everything, not for Naomi, but, but what you may not even realize, Ruth, is what you've done is you've come to take shelter and take refuge beneath the wings of the God of Israel. Now, if you uh, joined with us two weeks ago or if you've gone back to watch Ruth chapter 1, you, you'll find out that one of the things that Ruth pro- declares to Naomi in her beautiful confession to follow Naomi back to Israel is, is listen, I, I will come with you. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. She's thrown caution into the wind. Everything her mom and dad ever taught her, the the systems that she grew up in, the the family she grew up in, the faith she grew up in, and she says, I'm going to throw caution into the wind here and throw myself upon the mercy of your God and let me see, let me see what he can do. And this is so impressive, Boaz. Now, it got me thinking this week. Where have I, where have you found comfort and refuge What is it have you gone beneath to shelter you from the storms of life? Usually that question is a really hard question to answer because the easy answer, especially if you proclaim to be a Jesus follower, is just, well, God, of course. Jesus, of course. But the subtlety of our heart, I I always try to say that our, our heart is murky waters. It's hard to discern what's actually going on inside of us. In fact, the prophet Jeremiah would say that the heart is deceitful above all things that there's nothing as tricky to nail down as as the human heart, that I don't even want to be too confident on what I'm thinking or feeling because I I genuinely can't know for sure sometimes. And maybe you've experienced that. You you think you're doing something with good motives and then you find out, you know what, I was just hoping to be recognized or acknowledged. I didn't really help that old lady across the street because I genuinely cared. I mean, part of me did. But then there was a small part of me that was hoping she'd tip me. A small part of me was hoping that somebody was watching and they would notice me. And think, hey, how nice of a guy is he? Right? The heart is deceitful. And so it's times like this. When all of the things that we've been tempted to find refuge beneath, to find comfort in, begin to be threatened and some of them crumble. And some of us, we find refuge in ourselves in our type A, go-getter, able to manipulate our circumstances by just working hard and thinking smart and making good decisions, we find refuge in our strength, our strength. But we still know, and we lie awake at night, that at the end of the day, we're not as good as we profess to be, and that there's still things outside of our own control to which we just chalk it up to luck or chance or what were the odds of that? And then we go about trying to fix everything. Some of us, we find refuge in government, in education, in our finances, in stock market, in 401k. We find refuge in all these things that as we're finding out amidst this pandemic outbreak are extremely fragile, are extremely unable to take care of us when it really matters. They disintegrate like that. And then we're left stranded, riddled with anxiety, fearful and anxious that the things that we found refuge in can no longer bring us comfort and peace. And many of us didn't even realize we were taking comfort in them. Because when things are good, it's easy to say our trust is in Jesus. But it's when suffering hits that we find ourselves struggling. I was talking to a good friend and mentor um, about this idea. And he began to tell me a story about a a young man who uh, is in his mid-20s and and what recently happened to him and and how his eyes were redirected in this season. 
you see, he lives in Florida, and um, he said, in six years of being here, I've seen one snake uh, at my house. It was a little tiny 18-inch deal, and he said, um, th this young man, he's, he's been down here a year, and um, he's never seen a snake, except for this past week. He, he, his wife went outside, and there was a big 60-inch black snake. I don't even know what it was, uh, but he went and got a shovel and smashed that sucker Thank you, Jesus, uh, for shovels. And, and so uh, he, he, got, he deals with this snake, and then he goes inside, and uh, mid-20-year-old, uh, he opens up his Bible to do his devotions. And uh, he's got an app on his phone, and he's got his Bible, and his uh, devotions that day was in the book of Numbers. I think it's Numbers 21. It, it's a period in Israel's history when the Israelites, still wandering around the desert after they've left Egypt uh, and are looking and moving towards the Promised Land, where all of these snakes began, poisonous snakes began to uh, infect the camps of the Israelites. And they're biting people and people are dying. And so they cry out to their leader, Moses. And uh, God tells them, Moses, make this snake staff and hold it up. And when people look at the snake staff, it's so, so coincidental, right? That that morning there was a snake on his porch and now he's sitting down half an hour later to do his devotions. And it oh so happens to be about snakes and, and snakes in the story of Israel's history. And so he, he says, hey, hold the snake staff up. And when the Israelites were to look upon that snake staff, they would be healed. And his takeaway was that sometimes these kinds of moments come into our life right now on a global scale. As this coronavirus is ripping through our communities, as we're waiting with eager, anxious anticipation for when it's going to hit home here. As we're watching the news, as it's on our lips, as we're quarantined at home, his takeaway was to fix our eyes upon Jesus. That something like this is a unique opportunity when everything else is stripped away from us, all the places we take refuge in that betray us and let us down, that ultimately they can't be our foundation. They're shifting sand beneath our feet. And when the waves come crashing upon those things, things we didn't even realize we had put our hope and our trust and found refuge in, we have an opportunity to fix our eyes on Jesus. And this is what Boaz is so impressed with Ruth for to find her trust when she has absolutely nothing, when all hope is lost, that out of hopelessness births hope in the living God. To say I've lost hope in, in government systems and I've grown hopeless with education and I have no hope in, in the stock market and in, in our American currency to take care of me. I've grown hopeless that those things would be my daily bread, that they would meet my needs and bring comfort and peace upon me. Hope begins to rise. Like a phoenix from the ashes, it begins to rise up when we have an opportunity to find hope in a hopeless time and nothing other than God himself. Boaz says, I've shown you favor as an extension of God himself showing favor and kindness to you because you have found comfort beneath his wings. Now, I don't know if this visualization helps at all, but um, when I, I feel like finding refuge beneath God's wings doesn't really make a lot of sense to me, not really coming from a farming background myself, but understanding uh, that a mother hen, she she, she has these uh, rough, coarse feathers on the outside and this soft, down feathers deep beneath. Now, some of you guys, you're, you're hunters, man. You go out, uh, you shoot turkey, you pluck those suckers. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You pull out those rough, coarse feathers and uh, you, you, you know, I don't know what you do with them. You turn them into quill pens. I don't know what you do with them. Uh, and maybe you put them... Anyway, uh, so, so then you get down and you start pulling out the down feathers, right? You make a pillow, a comforter, I don't know, you do something with them. And, and um, these soft feathers aren't enough to protect, but these hard coarse feathers, they are. And what a mother hen would do, and what I imagine Boaz was extremely familiar with, which is why he makes this statement, is how a mother hen would gather her chicks made of only down feathers when they're little, they're just soft little chicks, beneath her wings when the storms of life would come. And it's here where these helpless, vulnerable, humble, have-nothing baby chicks 
would come running to their mother hen to protect them, to give them comfort, and to shelter them from the storm. It doesn't mean the storm does not beat down, and it doesn't mean the winds don't come crashing, but it means they've found comfort and protection and refuge beneath her wings. Jesus makes a similar statement. In the book of Matthew, he's, uh, he's lamenting. His heart is breaking for the people of Israel. And he says, you Israelites, you've missed it. He says, you've rejected the prophets and the people who've tried to bring a a word from God to you. And how often I've longed, he says, to gather you beneath my wings like a mother hen gathers her chicks. From the book of Ruth, thousands of years later to Jesus, referencing this idea that we might find refuge and hope beneath a God who is not absent, but has himself become the definition of coincidence. See, this is what the Bible's talking about. This story, this author is not talking about as luck would have it. He's saying, no, no, there's a God here who's in charge of the intricate details of Naomi's life and Ruth's life and Boaz's life who's in charge of your life and intricate details and knows you so deeply and so personally and has met you right where you are, loves you right as you are, who's orchestrating all things. Sometimes they don't feel like good things. The storms and the rains, but his desire for you is a good one, that you would forsake the things you found refuge in, that you might grow hopeless with the things that cannot give you hope, and that you would come running, running, to a God who loves you so very much that he would die for your sins and welcome you home, that you might find refuge beneath his wings. And so I want to finish the story here in the chapter. But it's this beautiful, beautiful moment. And as it closes out, Naomi once again discovers where hope can be found. Ruth said to him, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. Later, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat. Eat some of the bread and dip your morsel in the wine. And so Ruth sat with the reapers, and he passed her the roasted grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she rose to glean again, Boaz instructed his young men. So you see Ruth leaving the table and Boaz going, guys, come here, come here, huddle up, huddle up, come here real quick. Let me talk to you. When she rose to glean again, Boaz instructed his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had and gleaned. And it was about an ephah, ephah, excuse me, ephah of barley, which is about the, uh, about the size of one of those giant dog bag, uh, dog food things, those giant ones that you'd get at like Costco. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she also brought out and gave to her some of the food that she had left over and after she was satisfied. And her mother-in-law, this is Naomi, said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice on you. Naomi instantly realizes that there's no way that for one day of gleaning she should have had this much to show for her efforts, but then realizes in the little bit, just the little bit of grain that's brought back with her, that there's been favor shown to Ruth, that God showed up on day one of her working in the field. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked that his name was Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. And so Naomi also told her that this man, he is a close relative of ours. He's one of our redeemers. And Ruth said, and Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close to my young men until they have finished all of my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you should go out with this young woman, with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. And so uh, Naomi makes one more important note in the close of this episode, in this chapter. One that might go unnoticed on us until next week when we pick up the third chapter, the third episode in this short mini-series. This man, Boaz, is one of our redeemers. 
what she's saying there, and you may miss it. And maybe it's right that we do miss it. I should make you probably wait till next week to figure it out. But this idea of a redeemer in Israel, there was a law in Israel. This idea of carrying on the lineage and the bloodline of your family, that if a husband were to die before his wife could bear him children, it was customary for his brother to marry his uh, sister-in-law and then raise children under the brother's name. This was true not just of a brother, but of any close relative, that they would be somewhat obligated, if possible, to marry her and carry on a family with her, provide for her and care for her and give her a, a bloodline and a lineage. Naomi sees this. She sees what God's doing in this moment. It's not just favor that they have a safe place to get some food for this season. But something triggers in Naomi's mind. How beautiful the hand of God in painting over the details of our lives. She says, this man is one of our redeemers. You didn't stumble upon that field by accident. So I wonder in your life what things you're feeling like have happened by accident, both good and bad. For the good, I I feel like it invokes a sense of worship and awe in our lives that we go, man, it's so amazing the coincidence of how all these things worked out and uh, man, the universe is just crazy. Let that awe be turned to worship. For the God of the universe who has been intricately involved in weaving together the tapestry of your life. And then on the things that we might not find to be so great. Those bad luck moments, those coincidental moments that seem to rob us of our joy and our happiness and our comfort and our security. Realize, as we said at the end of week one, that there is a barley harvest just on the outskirts of your peripheral, where you might not be able to see it wallowing in self-pity or frustration or bitterness. There's something God is doing on the outskirts. And that you don't happen in this next season to wander upon and stumble upon a field. That the termination and layoff from work may result in your dream job. But maybe it doesn't. Maybe the goal of God is not to get you best life now but give you your best opportunity now to see and savor the God who would gather you beneath his wings, where you might take refuge in the midst of the storm. Not that there won't be a storm, but where you might take refuge in the midst of the storm. Would you pray with me as we close? Father, I thank you. I thank you that your hand is upon the smallest detail in our life. That you didn't build the machine and step away from it and allow it to run its course, but that you are intricately woven into the story and beauty of our life. That we can take refuge, comfort in a God who not only invites us to find our our refuge beneath his wings, but a God who has taken the darkest moment in human history when his own son was nailed to a cross and shown us that his plan for that moment was beyond what we could fathom. When the disciples, the followers of Jesus, all fled in despair and depression, when his mother wept tears of sorrow, when darkness fell upon the land, you proved that you would do great miraculous and amazing, awe-inspiring things as your hand and your arm is never too short, your hand is never too small, and you journey with us, care for us, and show us how much beauty can come from the ashes. Let us in this moment, when all hope has been lost, allow our hope to rise in you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.